We are in the book of 1 Corinthians. If you would take your Bibles, please open them to the 8th chapter today. <clears throat> the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And uh, we're going to be looking at this chapter as a whole. And we're titling the message, Navigating Liberty. Navigating Liberty. Let's uh, ask God for help as we get into this chapter. And I hope you're excited to learn from God's Word today. Amen? Praise the Lord. Father, feed us from your Word. It is good that we live in a world that we have physical food to eat and enjoy, but it is such a treasure to know that we can open up the pages of your Word and we can receive spiritual food that helps us grow and become more and more like Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to learn today from your Word as we navigate this chapter, teach us, I mean, teaching us about Christian liberty and how we ought to uh, look at that and how we ought to behave as a result of having this in our arsenal. We thank you, Lord, for your word, and we pray you would teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take a look at this chapter, verse uh, 1. There's only 13 verses here, but uh, let's take a look at them. Just follow along as I read to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> he says, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are, or are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have the knowledge or have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. May God add his blessing on his word. Now, as Americans, we are aware of liberty. Part of the Pledge of Allegiance of our flag involves with liberty and justice for all. I think you're familiar with that. Do you remember back in the day when in school you put your hand over your heart and you actually said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? Long, long ago in a galaxy far away, right? The Declaration of Independence tells us that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I have a, a little constitution in my uh, bottom drawer of my desk, and I got that out to get that quote 
And then I found myself fascinated by the laws of our land uh, re reuniting me with that knowledge. We have a great country, do we not? We need to be praying for America and uh, praying for the leaders of our land that we do not lose these rights and these freedoms that we enjoy. I think we should not take them for granted. We should cherish them while they're here. We appreciate these rights. We, want, we don't want to take them for granted. As Christians, we have been delivered from the bondage of sin. We know about liberty as well. We have been set free by Christ. Listen to the words of Galatians 5 and verse 1. It says, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ made us free. He saved us from the bondage of sin. We're no longer bound by the law. We're free in Christ. Paul goes on to add in that verse, do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Don't place yourself back in bondage once Christ has set you free. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul addresses a subject that many Christians struggle with, and that is Christian liberty. You notice in the first verse, now concerning things offered to idol, and there's a colon there, which means that there's a, a separation of the thought. Remember that Paul was written some questions. Remember in chapter 7, he says, concerning the things which you wrote to me, in that first verse of chapter 7, there were several issues that they needed answers for, and this was one of them. Now, the question is often raised in Christian circles, and it goes something like this. Can a Christian do, and now you have to fill in the blank. Have you ever been asked a question like that? It could be many, it could be many things, couldn't it? Can a Christian do this, or a Christian do that? Or maybe they pose it this way. What is wrong with, and then you fill in that blank as well. That leads us to having to decide whether these things are right or wrong. Paul taught them in chapter 6 and verse 12. He told them, remember, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are necessary. Remember him telling us that? Paul had no interest in allowing the sinful patterns by which he had escaped through God's grace. He didn't want to be entangled again into those sins, those things that he'd been set free for. He continues in the following verse. He says, I will not be brought under the power of any, any of those things. So I think the better question to ask as a Christian would be, not what can I or why can't I do something, but I think it should I do this or not. I think it's not can I, it's probably a should I. What is right with what I'm deciding to do? And that's what we're going to attempt to guide us or navigate through this morning. I want to just start out by saying, when we come to the question of what should we do, some things are always right, right? And here's some of the right things that we should never falter on. We should always know that obeying God's word is always right. Following God's will is always right. Now, you, Hopefully you would agree with me that telling the truth, being kind, hating sin, and working hard are always right. I don't think we would have much argument with those things, but there are some things that are always wrong. And let's take a look at the short list. <laughs> if you are a liar or cheating or you're a stealer, those are always wrong, always wrong. Never a right time to do a wrong thing. And there's never a right way to do a wrong thing. Remember that. Now, some things are not so clear, are they? Because there are some, like what is being addressed in this passage, there are some things that God's word does not give us a definite yes or a definite no in. He leaves it to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and some of us would come up with a, it's not so bad, it's not as bad as something, or I could do this because I have Christian liberty. And then there would be other things that we would look at and go, 
absolutely not. Now, there are some of us who might have to adopt this statement. I told you this a week ago, that our family developed a, a sense of others may, I cannot. In other words, maybe it's a family decision. Everyone else around you is doing something that you feel and your conviction by the Spirit is telling you, no, don't do it. Then you should not do it. But I think on both of those cases, we'll get to this here this morning, that on either one of these cases, it's not for you to be the Holy Spirit of God in someone's life and say, well, we don't do it, so you shouldn't do it. I'll illustrate that toward the end of my message. In our text today, we're going to consider three factors that will help guide us in the decisions that we make that we call Christian liberty regarding something, whether it's right or wrong, to participate in. So let's look at them today. The first thing we look at in verses 1 through 8 is that of knowledge. He starts out by saying, we know that we all have knowledge. How many of you have knowledge? The Bible is encouraging us today. We know something. Isn't that great? We all have knowledge. Woohoo! That should, that should excite you. But he warns us, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Let's navigate what this is all about. In our text, the issue that was presented as wondering whether or not it was something that they could do, look at verse Four, concerning the eating of things offered to idol. Now that was the issue. Can a Christian eat? And this is that culture and that time. There, were, uh, there was idolatry all over Corinth. They worshiped many gods. And it was not uncommon for them to offer meat, cows, sheep pigs, etc., on an altar, and that would be offered to this idol, and then somehow it would make its way to the market, and it would be on a good sale. And if you were a thrifty Christian living in Corinth, you would go, the hamburger that was raised over here on this godly farm was eight ninety nine a pound, and this, off, this meat that was offered on an idol is three ninety nine a pound, you would have a hard way of talking many of us out of buying the cheap stuff, right? But there were principles involved in some of the people that were having a problem with that because they had been recently saved from that idolatrous practice. And so they knew that this was idolatry. This was something that was offered to idols. So they had a huge problem with it. And in their principle mind, they would rather spend eight ninety nine dollars a pound for the, the good stuff than to buy the cheap stuff because they knew that that would violate their conscience. Do you understand the dilemma that they're in? It doesn't sound like it's big because if you look at this passage, we understand the presentation that Paul is giving. Some real world issues that we're dealing with that faced they, they revolved around their culture and that they lived in. Some of them felt it was okay to participate without violating their testimony. Others believed it was a sin to do so, and so how would Paul direct them? These issues that they faced were far different from the earlier issues that he talked about in chapter 6. For instance, is it wrong to commit sexual immorality? Is it wrong to lie? Is it wrong to steal? You can't find any wiggle room in those commands, can you? There's a right or a wrong in that. The issues that were determined by their motivation, though, behind their eating, and then the consequences that would be produced by their eating. Therefore, Paul had to present this answer to them in a way that it would explain the principle of grace while exercising their Christian liberty. The answer would cause the believer to think about the difference between legalism, rules, you understand that, as opposed to selfish individualism, 
Nobody can tell me what to do. And we have those two polar opposites that are even in the churches today. There are people who want to make up rules and regulations, and legalism is the religion of the day for many churches. And then there are a lot of Christians who just say, listen, you can't tell me what to do. Those two polar opposites exist. So let's go through this passage. Number one, we find when the question arises, should a Christian eat meat offered to idols? That doesn't even sound like a deal now, does it? What is your deal? What is the issue that you're facing? I know there are a lot. Christians have a lot of issues with different things and different criteria. So we ne- we're going to just bunch all those together. I'm not going to name it a particular one because I'm not going to name yours and I'll leave you out, okay? So we're going to just talk about what the scripture tells us, but I believe this is a principle to help guide us in all the things that we struggle with when it comes to Christian liberty. He says knowledge puffs up. Knowledge puffs up. Knowledge by itself is simply filling us with facts. You, you grow your cranium. <laughs> your head might not get much bigger, but tell you something right now, that people who are smart and know it, they have a big head. Have you noticed anybody that's got a lot of wisdom, they like to tout it as, look how smart I am, you know? And, and so knowledge does puff up. When you know something, you know, I know stuff. Well, good, I'm glad you know stuff. But look at what Paul says in verse 2. I love this, because when Paul is addressing the area of knowledge, all of these people who are smart stand up right away. Well, I know that. Verse 2, if anyone thinks that he knows anything, now this is the Apostle Paul speaking, okay? He says, he knows nothing as he ought to know. What does he mean? There's always something more to learn, isn't there? You may not have all the facts in front of you. You may know, you may be knowledgeable about something, but you don't know everything. And that's the problem with knowledge, isn't it? You may have a collection of facts in your mind, but just like practicing the piano, if you don't practice perfectly, guess what? You're not going to be perfect. You're just going to be knowledgeable about the things you know, and that's as far as you can go. But if we have all the facts, then we can grow in our knowledge. The Bible is not given to us just to increase our knowledge, but it is given to us to guide us by the word, by our conduct. We will never completely understand the scripture, nor will we completely understand God, but we must always be ready to learn, right? So we look at verse 3 through 8, and we find out that knowledge is necessary. So Paul isn't just throwing the knowledge thing out. Well, if you know something, you don't know everything, so you know nothing. (laughs) You know, we don't want to get to that uh, attitude where, well, you know, them smart people, they don't know nothing, so I'm just going to stick with what I don't know. No, that's not what God is teaching us here. He wants us to learn. He wants us to acquire not just facts, but he wants us to apply these things to our lives as well. So he begins it in verse 3. He says, listen, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. How do we know that? Because in 1 John chapter 5 and chapter 3 as well, it says that if God loves us before we love him, and because we love him, then he loves us. And there's that reciprocal relationship there. Verse 4, uh, we are talking about the idols. We know that an idol is nothing. Right, And so there are some things that we need to understand uh, when, we, when we think about this liberty uh, that, comes, I'm sorry, that comes to us. I'm jumping ahead of my notes. Get, get my mind here focused. I know nothing here. Hang on. An idol is nothing. It is just a, li- it, an idol is nothing, he says in verse 4. We know that an idol is nothing. We know that. So we need to understand that. There's no other God but God. Uh, there are so-called gods, verse 5, and so-called lords that try to put themselves into positions of authority. But Paul says very clearly in verse 6 that there is only one God. Don't be confused in verse 6 where he talks about there is one God, the Father, and then he goes to say that there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. 
thinking that there are two. If you were in Sunday school this morning, uh, Brother Ralph is teaching us uh, about the Trinity, that there is a three in one. God is one. There's not three gods, but there's one. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, there, the Lord our God is one Lord. One. That's it. He is in three different personages, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he's teaching us that God is over all. Verse 7 reminds us that not everyone has this knowledge. Knowledge is puffing up, but knowledge is necessary. And we know that an, an idol is nothing, but some people don't know that. For some with a consciousness of an idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. So we need to know that as well. So you can get away with doing what you think is okay. Tempted to say some illustration, but I'm not going to. I just want to keep it on track here with my mind and our thinking. When we think about this issue, there were people that were convinced in their mind that this practice of eating meat offered to idol was absolutely wrong. I can't do it because I was saved from idolatry. And I don't want to follow that footstep ever again in my life. I've been saved from it. I'm convinced that it's wrong. And there are Christians who never grew up in that kind of environment. And they're thinking, hey, eating meat offered to idol is nothing. An idol is nothing. Don't worry about it. And there we wound the conscience of those who are battling it out of their mind without all the facts. We can go in and teach them that an idol is nothing. And it may not ever change them from that position. They still have the knowledge that it is defiling and they don't want to cross that line. And we'll get into a little later when we think about defiling the conscience, but having that knowledge is important. If we were to think of our brothers and sisters in Christ, instead of just pushing our way onto people, then we might be a loving group that would guide each other and be careful with each other rather than just saying, I don't care what you think, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And a lot of Christians are act, uh, acting that way. Knowledge and love work together, which leads us to the next point in verse 9. He says, beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak, verse 9. And so we have to, we have to think about love. Some newly saved Christians found it difficult to free themselves from their past. And so it was hard for them and difficult for them to think about these influences that were there. And then all of a sudden they just turn them off with a switch. Once they realized that they were worshiping idols and God convicted them of that, they were saved from that idolatry stronghold in their life. They were reluctant and even considered it offensive and sinful to return to any association with that practice. You can follow with this on almost every issue that you have to think about when it comes to Christian liberty. There are some people who feel that something is no big deal. And there are other people, other Christians, who've been saved out of an environment that looks completely different at that subject. Whatever it might be that you're thinking, and you, we have to consider in love not to become someone who will stumble them into acting sinfully, violating their conscience. Stronger Christians were free to eat meat that was offered to idol because they knew that the idol was nothing. It has no effect. Have you ever looked at an idol? Have you ever seen an idol? We know that some of them are, you know, idols are nothing. Had no effect. But it is necessary that these Christians, even though they knew an idol was nothing, that they needed to act in love toward their newly saved brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, so we should understand this from the believer's position that everything is okay for me to do. We read this like this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And you could even add the last two words in a parenthetical there, say, to enjoy. God's given us all things. He has allowed us to enjoy all things. He wants us 
to be living in this world to enjoy those things that are, are his to give to us. But knowing this, knowing this should prompt us to think about our brother in the Lord who was saved out of maybe an idolatrous home to lead these questions about doubtful issues. Is it really a question of can we or maybe it should be should we? God has given us all these things to enjoy, but should I enjoy everything that is set before me? Should I have a little bit of conscience in my own life to say, will this glorify the Lord? Will this honor Christ? Our men have been going through a book on Tuesday nights. We were taking a summer break, but it's the book Transforming Grace. And out of one of the chapters, Jerry Bridges writes this statement. Listen, we need to always keep in mind that God is not only our Savior and Heavenly Father through Christ, but he is still also our God. Listen to this. As God's children, we are subject to the laws of his realm. And out of response to his grace, we should obey him in a loving and grateful way. In other words, don't throw everything that you know about Jesus out the wall so that you can do what you want to do and call it Christian liberty. We're still bound by the laws of God and his word. Paul warned the Christians not to allow this freedom that they had had to become a stumbling block to those who are weak in verse 9. So the issue here is that we become either a stumbling block to someone, that guy is tripping that other one, you're noticing that in the top picture, right? Or these building blocks that our children had when they were young and We used to help them build castles and towers that we would knock over. (laughs) But we have a choice to make as a a brother or a sister in Christ. I can go ahead and do what I want to do because I feel it's my Christian liberty, my right as a believer. It's not going to hurt anybody because I don't think anything of those things, they're nothing to me. But what you've completely ignored is your brother who is weak in Christ that you're violating their conscience. You have just become a stumbling block to that person. We are told in the Bible to edify one another. We're told to not provide for ways for our brother to fall into sin. And as a Christian who wants to please the Lord and also be an encouragement to his brother or sister in Christ, he needs to learn to defer to the weaker brother to enable him to grow in the Lord, to take some time to help them fully grasp the meaning of liberty, not rub it in their face and say, no, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. I can do this. I grew up in a home that said no dancing, no drinking, no smoking, No movies. I mean, the list could go on, couldn't it? Some of you may have grown up in that. My wife and I went to a movie the other day, and and I I still have that little part of me in my heart that's like, I'm looking around, I hope nobody, you know? Isn't that horrible? I mean, that is my Christian liberty to go to a movie that I can enjoy with my wife. But sometimes there are things that when we have been inbred into, and we've learned, and we've been grown into, that it just, when when we are learning about our Christian liberty, that there really isn't anything wrong with that as long as you have some understanding of maybe picking one that's not going to be trash, right? We have to think about maybe another brother or sister in the Lord. Who, and that, those, those examples are, are pale in comparison to some, some of the things that people involved in with. I think the very first time that I was asked a question Uh, that threw me off guard was when I first moved out here, somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, do you think it's okay for me to use CBD oil? Is it prescribed by your doctor? Yep, okay, no wrong, prescribed. Now, taking a blunt and smoking that just because you want to may be something that would violate someone's conscience. And we have to think about some of those issues, don't we, in our world that we live in. 
I can do whatever I want, but should I? That's the question. And in love, we want to motivate our decision to do whatever we're doing, as we said earlier, motivated by our passion to follow the Lord rather than just doing what I want to do. Robert Gramacki wrote in his commentary, he says, as we're thinking about helping others grow in the Lord, and yet using our liberty, he says, the reckless use of liberty violates the purpose for which Christ died. If Christ died to deliver men from sin, why should Christians use their freedom to lead others into it? You see what I'm getting at? See what Paul is trying to teach? That it's probably okay for you because you think of an idol as nothing, but in reality, these other people are thinking differently, and so therefore, you're pushing the issue in their mind as like violating their conscience. So we need to be careful. Christians should act in love toward one another, not just do whatever we want, exercising our freedom whenever we want, the Bible says in Galatians 6 and verse 10, as we, have there, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now can we look at our conscience? The third point in this passage is verses 10 through 13. Paul talks about our conscience. Paul concludes this chapter by saying, if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating of an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him be who is weak be emboldened to eat those things also? They're following examples. That's why as a pastor, many, many years, I've decided that I'm not going to do certain things just because I don't want a, a congregation or a member of our church or someone who attends our church to say, well, I do this because pastor does it. I want them to have a conviction in their own mind and freedom in their own heart to do something, not just to follow a leader. There are some things we should imitate, and that's Christ-like behavior. But when it comes to Christian liberty, maybe something that's on the edge, I can do it, but should I do it? That's, that's the real issue. The mature Christian may not consider eating meat offered to idol as anything. They've been saved from idolatry, could be wounded from these actions, however. Paul used the word perish. In verse 11, because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish. It doesn't mean that he will die physically, but what it really means here is that these actions would weaken them and cause them to make a decision that would be in contrary to their conscience and thus make them perish, make them weak. So Paul is telling us to be careful because when you sin against the brethren, he says in verse 12, and wound their weak conscience, notice that you sin against Christ, not against your brother, but against the Lord. So we need to really be careful. Thiessen explains in his book, Systematic Theology, that the conscience is the knowledge of self in relation to a known law of right or wrong. Now, let me explain to you what that all means because when we think of our conscience we have Jiminy Cricket years ago telling us let your conscience be your guide no that is not what we we want the Lord to be our guide the Word of God to be our guide okay so listen to this man's intellect his thinking his brain enables him to discern what is right and wrong sensibility appeals to man to do one or the other. And the will of man decides to go with it. The Bible tells us that our conscience can be defiled and even seared. There are verses that substantiate those points. Paul addressed both of those issues, one in Timothy. He said that we can defile our conscience in Romans chapter 1, but then also sear it. In other words, burn it to a point where nothing bothers us. Maybe you've met people like this. Doesn't this bother you? Nope. And even Christians who say, and I'm going to use this in Luke quote, Christians say that they're born-again believers practicing ungodly activities. I think their conscience is seared. In some cases, I believe they're really not saved. But I, I can't be the judge of that. 
But I'm saying that so often when we just sin and sin and sin and sin, it gets easier and it gets easier and it gets easier, doesn't it? Less guilt, less guilt, less guilt, until you finally hit the wall of the Holy Spirit of God finally smacking you back into reality, and then it bothers you. The conscience can be defiled. Listen, this, we learn from the scripture that the standard of conscience then can be manipulated. That's why it's important for us to not just to listen to our conscience. Because we can manipulate our conscience to say, there is nothing wrong with this, even though there is a lot wrong with it. If you read the scripture, you would know God says to flee those things, to do not practice those things. But we don't care about scripture. We're trying to feel our way through in justification. I'm justifying what I want to do, so I'm manipulating the standard of my conscience. A parent might teach their children, for instance, that it's okay to go into the store, and while you're in there, pick up some things and put them in your pocket. It's okay. The man has plenty of money, right? And, and we see some of that behavior being played out in our life today. I mean, the first crisis that comes along, stores are being emptied out, and there's no one doing anything about it because of what? Reparations or something? Whatever the reason might be, it's wrong, it's sinful, it's absolutely wrong. And if a believer does that, your conscience ought to bother you a lot. And God help you if it doesn't. The voice of our conscience never changes. So if you're a believer, the Lord is saying, it's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. And the voice is always going to say that, no matter what circumstance you're in and what position of life you're in. It's always wrong to sin, right? Amen. You're on my side, Bob. <laughs> so it's important for us to have the right conscience. Our conscience should not be our guide. The word of God should be our guide so that the voice of, of our conscience never changes so that we don't violate the standard that has been set in our lives as good. We might ignore the voice of our conscience which guides us, but it's really the will that decides them. Romans 2.15 tells us about the Gentiles who do not have the law of God in their hearts, but he says their law becomes a law to themselves. Even though they don't have the Jewish Ten Commandments of the law, they have a right and wrong built into the standard of their life that the voice of God is going to call out to them to show them something is right or something is wrong. Paul continues in verse 15 of Romans 2. He says about these Gentiles who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves, their thought accusing or else excusing them. In other words, God is going to help you know what's right and wrong through our conscience. Now going back to what Paul taught us, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 or 6 and verse 12, he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are necessary. So one must use caution. When doing what we feel is right, we may become a stumbling block to someone who is weak. Gramacchi goes on in his commentary to say that the reckless use, I'm sorry, the reckless use of our liberty actually wounds the weak brother's conscience. It discourages and frustrates him and it destroys the confidence in the loving concern that he has for others or others to him. Paul even points out when we cause the weak brother to sin or to violate his conscience, we sin against Christ in verse 12. Now, look at verse 13. This is an extreme position to take, an extreme position. I don't know that there would be many of us who would say never. There are two words that are always hard to say uh, because they're, they're extreme. At never and always. <laughs> those are two words that are difficult. We'll say those in a marital fight. You always say that. And, and of course, the defense is, no, I don't always say that. Uh, you never do this. And, of course, the obvious defense for that is, no, I don't never. I never do. I sometimes do. So it's hard to, to use those words, but this is what Paul said. At the end of the discussion about food offered to idols, knowing what we know, helping us understand in love what we should do for our brothers who are, wo are weak in the Lord and needing to pull them along, Paul made this statement. I don't know if you or I can make this statement, but Paul said this. 
Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, if this is something that's going to violate his conscience and wound him, and I'm going to sin against Christ, Paul says this, I will never again eat meat. What does he mean? He doesn't mean he will never have a hamburger. What he's saying is he's not going to eat meat offered to idols so that he would not make his brother stumble. Now, it may be around them. That might be what Paul's saying, but I think never is a very strong word here. Now, listen, as we went through this navigating liberty, what I want to teach for just a couple of minutes is what this passage does not teach us. And I think this is going to set us free in this area of Christian liberty. When a brother who is not a new believer becomes offended by the actions that someone not following his man-made rules of conduct have been placed there by some legalist. That is not what this passage is teaching. You are not violating someone's conscience if they're a believer who is mature in the Lord and they're saying, I'm offended at that. Oh, really? That is not offensive. It's not going to shake them off of their mores of Christianity. You know, you are brothers in the Lord. You've grown in the Lord, and there are some things that you're doing that actually offend me too. I mean, we could go back and forth in this, couldn't we? This is why the Lord tells us about Christian liberty. There are certain things that we can do because we have, and I'm going to use it, the right to do it. The scripture says it's a no, or it's it, there's no no, no yes. It's There's principles that guide me, and as long as I don't do the things that are going to cause me to stumble into sin, then I can do those. But we're not to pony up to someone's man-made rules, you know. <laughs> the example could be made like this. You walk into church and you're dressed with uh, no coat, no tie for a guy. And someone walks up to you and say, you know, you really look a lot better if you had a tie. So I might succumb to that pressure and put a tie on, right? That's what that collar was made for. God wouldn't have made that shirt the way he did without thinking that there should be a tie there to finish that up. Well, the next Sunday I would walk in with a tie, but then that person might say, you know, it would look really a lot better if you had a coat on too. So, wow, I got to go to the store and buy a coat now and find a coat that fits and, you know, find one that I could wear too. And then it would be you'd walk in there and they go, you know, those pants just don't match that coat and tie. You need a shirt and a pair of pants, you know, maybe some new shoes. The list could go on and on and on. The ladies have got the same problem. Oh, you're just wearing a skirt? You should wear a dress. You should have your hair made up. You should have no makeup. You should have all the makeup. You get what I'm saying? There are all kinds of rules and regulations that guide people that we don't need to follow. The scripture is our guide. Listen to what God is saying to you. Now, if not wearing a tie offends a new believer in Christ, I don't know how. But if that were be the case, I don't even know if I would put a tie on. But I'm just going to say, there are, there are hills to fight on that we can die that those are not the ones. Let me tell you a story that in this book that we were reading uh, recently in our Bible study, Transforming Grace, shared a story about a missionary family that left the mission field over a man-made rule. Listen to this. A missionary family was forced off the mission field over peanut butter. A missionary family was sent to a field where peanut butter was not available. So they asked friends to occasionally send them peanut butter because there was none on the field. Now, the problem was the other missionaries that were already on the field decided that they wouldn't have peanut butter. It's more spiritual because they couldn't get it. And they didn't think enough to maybe write their friends to send it to them. So they had developed a more spiritual attitude to not have peanut butter. And these new missionary families 
did not see having peanut butter as a lack of spirituality. So they continued to receive and even enjoy peanut butter. The pressure from the other missionaries became so intense that the newer family finally gave up and left the mission field. Now you're probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking as I read that story and as we read in our men's Bible study. How stupid. How stupid. To get into a tussle over something so insignificant as peanut butter. But here we are. Could you insert different categories in that same illustration? There are people who come to a church and rather than be enveloped with love, in the hopes that they would grow in the Lord. A church would start patterning some kind of stupid rule instead of helping them grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. God forbid that a church who is to act and be an example of Jesus would be like that. Going back to Galatians, we learn that we have been given freedom through Christ. But the caution that Paul told the Galatians in chapter 6 was don't use liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but through love serve the Lord. That's good advice. Remember, all things are lawful, but not all things. Father, guide us. There's so many things that we could think of right now as examples of what might violate someone's conscience, but we're really just talking about people who've got a legalistic attitude rather than helping people grow in the Lord. If we were so concerned about helping others grow in the Lord, we would drop some of those legalistic rules and truly disciple people in the name of Jesus, helping them grow in the Lord. But Lord, I pray that as we move and navigate through our liberty in Christ, that we would not become that person that says, you can't tell me what to do. But Lord, I pray that our love for others would cause us to be careful as we act out those things that we feel are okay in the scope of God's word to us. And help us to be teachable, lovable, and exemplifying. In the name of Jesus, be praised. Let's sing together, uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I don't know.